24 years ago today, by the day, thousands of Liverpool supporters went over to Sheffield to watch a game of football. 96 of them never came back. Thousands of others were physically injured and mentally injured and remain traumatised to this day. Quite a substantial number have taken their own lives over the years because of how they have lived with that label that they were somehow responsible for the deaths of their fellow supporters. And Margaret Thatcher was in power at the time. And very shortly after, when a public inquiry um, under Lord Justice Taylor reported in the August after the disaster in the April, Lord Justice Taylor was, was unequivocal in his comments that the cause of the disaster was the breakdown of police control, i.e. South Yorkshire Police had caused the deaths of those 96 fans. Margaret Thatcher, in documents we've seen, said, there's no way we can hold the police accountable. She actually rejected the findings of Lord Justice Taylor. Whilst accepting the report, she didn't welcome it. And that was... Those, that, that was the kind of parameters in which Hillsborough operated for 23 years. And there was no real fight because the people who died at Hillsborough, their families weren't political. They were actually people who believed in the system and they put the faith in the system and boy were they in for a, you know, a shock and an awakening, and what a cruel way to learn a lesson, because it has been cruel how they learned the lesson. And sad to say, and I'll say it quite plainly, some families are happier even to this day working within the system. They still want to believe in that system, so that because they are more comfortable when they're invited into the House of Commons, when they're invited into the director's box at Anfield or somewhere else. But there are a hard core of families who wised up very quickly, as to what was happening. And my involvement initially was an academic one as a researcher, and I monitored the inquests. And I spent a lot of time, got to know families, got to know survivors. And I could see the families that were actually going, this is not right, these are not telling the truth. And right across the board, they were just average, working class people. The who told the truth, they said. Yes, yes. <laughs> Because three days after the, the truth, when we knew what happened, the media put out that, and not only the sun, that was the most notorious, but the, the vein ran through most papers that somehow the dead were implicit in their own deaths and that their fellow supporters had pickpocketed the dead, urinated on them and attacked policemen. And that lie originated from a news agency in Sheffield, through Sheffield MP Evan Patnick, who's now dead. And it was sanctioned, make no mistake, it was sanctioned by the government of the day. And the whole context in which the investigation into Hillsborough occurred was in the climate of cover-up. And that cover-up existed until last September, when there was finally a report published on the 12th of September, which said uh, the fans weren't to blame, and um, not only could uh, a, a few of them have been saved, but 41 of them could have been saved in all probability, 58. I go a step further and say none of them should have died. They all could have been saved had the police been being correct and also the stadium been uh, suitable. The point I'm making here is that for 23 years, people who were victims had to fight in a climate where they were, had a cloud of suspicion hanging over them. And the toll that has taken on people has been tremendous. And our campaign grew out of inactivity by the Hillsborough Family Support Group campaign because they were working within the parameters of the established version and the establishment. And our campaign took on a more radical approach and I worked in a climate where people said, um, oh, well, Hillsborough's not political. And that was amongst our own people because they, they didn't see it. And generally that was the case. It, it was seen as football and people on the left rejected it. I can recall a radical bookshop that wouldn't take the first report that I, I co-authored because, oh, that's football. And we don't have things like that in the shop. And it took years to argue this was political. And this was a further crushing of the working class 
along the lines of what, of what Thatcher had done to the miners, to the hunger strikers. And earlier this week, when people, when uh, the Reading chairman and the, the, um, the Wigan chairman called for minute silences at games today, I tweeted and said, there's been far too many minute silences as a result of Margaret Thatcher's policies, and I, for one, would not support one. And people say, well, she's someone's mother. You know, she had a family. Well, those hunger strikers had a family. She was a heartless woman that let other mothers watch their children starve to death. Let's not forget that. So don't waste sympathy. Sympathy is a wasted sentiment anyway. Our campaign went from strength to strength because we just wouldn't say no. Every door that was shut in our face, we went round it. And we didn't take notice of what the politicians said. And we had enough of them saying there's nowhere you can go. Enough lawyers wouldn't take it. No, there's nothing you can do. But we wouldn't accept that. And irony of irony, when we get the official stamp, we get the rubber stamp to say, do you know what, all you've been saying for 23 years, you were right. When that rubber stamp came last September, it was a Tory government, let's not call it a coalition, let's call it what it is, yeah. a Tory government, same government as covered it up all those years ago. And Labour were quick on the bandwagon, quick on the bandwagon to, to condemn but let's remember that Labour were in office more than the Tories throughout the cover-up of Hillsborough and further covered it up. Yeah. And so I don't buy into the politicians in the last few years jumping on the bandwagon, coming in on the white charger when they knew they were on a winner. And I'm saying this for a reason and I'm linking it to the work I do now um, with Unite and the community because I'm very much involved in a number of campaigns but still involved in Hillsborough but involved in the bedroom tax stuff and what we're seeing at meetings are people coming out who aren't political in that mainstream way and they're coming to meetings because they're suffering as previous speakers have said they're on the margins, they're on the bones of their arses, and they are losing their properties. And horrendous stories, not just the bedroom tax of cuts. There's people here today, I know, from Manchester and Salford, where mental health day services are closing, and they have nowhere to go. And, you know, I was told before I came in here of, of a member of one of the day centres who recently committed suicide because of the lack of support. That's the reality of what's out there. But what I say to you here, and I, I, I introduce this by saying I'm an outsider, I'm not a joiner. When I put that tweet up the other day about no minute silence, some, most people retweeted it, but someone tweeted and called me and said, Sheila Coleman, um, a sad scouse Hattonite, show some respect for Margaret Thatcher. Well, I was amused at my, the reference to me being like Derek Hatton, because far from ever, never being a member of the Labour Party, I was certainly never a member of Militant, so I was amused by that. It turned out this was some Cambridge-educated West Ham fan. Yeah. Not that I've got anything <laughs> against West Ham fans. <laughs> Thanks. I think um, there have been some excellent contributions which I think go to the heart of um, how we're living at the moment and what we're up against, um, particularly in relation to how these changes in welfare are directly affecting people and how um, they're being reflected on those suffering most in such a negative fashion uh, by both the government and the media. The Hillsborough campaign, um, I think, because of the longevity of the campaign, um, can act as an inspiration to other groups. And I think from the report last September, certainly other groups um, have been able to kind of come out and organize in a more structured fashion. Uh, for example, the All Grief Truth and Justice campaign, mainly because it was South Yorkshire Police that's then enabled um, that campaign to actually um, first the issue around the Independent Police Complaints Commission, um, of which I'm not a big fan, but nevertheless it's there, um, to organise and to investigate South Yorkshire police officers um, from 1984 and around. Um, there's dark days whenever you're campaigning. Um, we had dark years throughout the Hillsborough campaign, and at times you have to draw strength from other groups. In our case, um, and, and for me personally, I grew strength from uh, Bloody Sunday families who at one time, it appeared, would never receive anything by way of um, anybody acknowledging 
the murders and loss of life there, let alone an apology um, from a Tory Prime Minister. And I think that that is what other groups can do in relation to Hillsborough. It's not over, we're still fighting, and the fight will be political, even though there might be legal solutions. And I say that by way of kind of uh, showing that you can have victories and sometimes they take a long time, but united we can actually um, bring about change where none seemed likely. Um, and we did take on the state, and in Liverpool we took on um, the, the huge, you know, corporation of News International now 24 years ago. We took them on after that awful headline in the sun. And um, no one else took them on. We took them on, and to this day, the paper's still boycotted on Merseyside. And Tom Watson, the MP, pointed out last year to me, he went, um, you, t you took them on, and it's taken the rest of the country 23 years to catch up uh, via the Leveson Inquiry. Unite the unity, uh, unite the community, and, and people have made reference to it from the floor, I think is a viable... Um, organization that, could, that people can utilize for their own ends and I think it's important because people are disenfranchised people haven't got a say and for me my own involvement in getting involved in Unite Community was because I saw it as a way of organizing um, people like myself who, who were unemployed and the woman from Levin's room was spot on about how it's taken one campaign where people see it's our swimming pool but now when it came to the library people are seeing the bigger picture you know from the pool to the library to how people are suffering cuts um, at, at a greater level and um, in respect of uh, the woman from Lancaster and Morecambe and the march and the police not policing it as was said from the person in Wigan um, who, who just carried on the other week when we had the bedroom tax march in Liverpool on the 30th of March, the police likewise refused to police it, but we went ahead anyway. And, um, and, and in fact, the chair was there, and she knows, you know, kind of it, it went off great. Much better, I have to say, than the march on the, or the demonstration on the 16th of March where Labour piggybacked on the grassroots campaigners. That, mo that demonstration was policed okay, and that was an absolute disgrace where Labour jumped on the bandwagon and wouldn't let grassroots bedroom tax campaigners who got it all off the ground, wouldn't let them speak. Shame. You know, so, but that, that's what you're up against. And I'll finish on this point because I think it shows the value of community membership. Um, I'm a member of the Unite uh, CASA community branch and the other week at the meeting um, a motion was put forward which was passed and which I am now distributing around the various branches and uh, regions. And it was in relation to workfare and the retrospective legislation. And what we did was call on uh, the General Secretary of UNITE to question every Labour MP that UNITE sponsors and say, how did you vote or how didn't you vote and why? Because the biggest thing we've got going for us, and it's a case of following the money, is actually the economics of this. In terms of UNITE, the largest union, the funding of the Labour Party. The Labour Party don't deserve funding in my estimation. And I don't think it can be put right. I think people do have to build another party. And that is controversial for me as, a, as you know, an employee of UNITE. But I haven't got a problem with that. Because I think that is what they're up against. And UNITE as a union will lose out unless it gets to grips. Because I'm out there in communities, in groups, and I'm telling you what's coming across is what was putting people off joining UNITE is the fact of the sponsoring of the Labour Party, and that has to be addressed very seriously. Thank you.